Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Pan African debate. Climate change impacts us as topic of discussion this day. The issues of climate change is becoming more and more urgent every day as humanity is getting closer to pushing the planet to its boundaries and causing irreversible damage to the Earth system. The African continent, one of the most vulnerable, is under seriously increasing threats which stand a chance to worsen food security, income and welfare situations of most rural and urban dwellers. Two approaches in the name of mitigation and adaptation have been put out by experts to prevent and manage the eventualities of climate change across the globe. However, despite being responsible for only about 6% of global carbon dioxide emissions, experts say Africa is and will continue being the most hardest hit region by climate change, with nations like Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, South Sudan, Niger, Kenya, just to name a few, constantly being faced with devastating impacts of the climatic changes. With growing populations and advancements in technologies, climate change seems impossible to avoid and mitigation and adaptation being the only surviving methods proposed as of now by experts. But is vulnerable Africa capable of standing against and surviving from these intense droughts, floods, storms, heat waves, melting glaciers, warming oceans and rising sea levels only through mitigation and adaptation strategies? Can the African continent be a solution to climate crisis as proposes other analysts? We discuss this on today's edition of the Pan-African debate. Stay with us. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasure to know you are honoring the 3 p.m. rendezvous on your Pan African television. It's Saturday and it's the Pan African debate. As topic of discussion this afternoon, impact of climate change, how can Africa survive by mitigation and adaptation? We shall be discussing this after uh, realizing that in no time, from the 6th to the 18th of November, the continent, Afghan the countries within the globe or across the globe will be gathering in Egypt to uh, talk about uh, uh, ways to go on uh, with fighting against climate change impacts and how to also live with it. What has been termed within uh, the past years by experts as mitigation and adaptation strategies. However, some analysts think they have just been paper proposals and nothing has been done as far as uh, promises which were laid by most of these participants at the various uh, COP uh, uh, conferences and uh, this comes again in another moment uh, for the COP27 holding in Egypt. Can uh, Africa survive through mitigation and adaptation? Others, however, think that it is not enough, but the African continent in itself is strong enough to produce better solutions to be able to fight against uh, climatic changes. To discuss on this, uh, this afternoon we have uh, guests joining us from across the globe, from uh, Nigeria, Tanzania, and equally the United States. Let's start from from you uh, in the United States, Mr. Elijah Enoako, you are a researcher with Lakes University on African Development. Welcome to the Pan-African debate. Thank you, um, co-panelists. I hope we're going to have a fruitful discussion this afternoon about um, climate change. I know this is an issue that, you know, when you talk about climate change in Africa and pollution, a lot of people, you know, they're rolling their eyeballs and say, what are you talking about? What are we polluting? And how does that affect us? But 
Um, I think by the end of the day today, we should be able to highlight how that affects us, even if we are not the ones actually polluting the world, but it does affect us. Global warming, that's why they call it global. Uh, a 0.5 degree warming in the United States is the same disastrous effect that's going to happen in Africa, all over Africa. So it is a global issue. Hopefully we'll have a fruitful discussion. So thanks for having me. A pleasure to have you equally, Mr. Elijah. Let's go over to Nigeria and join uh, Mr. Dami Mola Olawi. You are a public affairs analyst. Welcome to the Pan-African Television. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, ple it's a pleasure being with you and with my co-panelists. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Dami Mola. Let's go over to Tanzania to join Mr. Joseph Moses Olishange. You've been on this Pan-African television once, and we're talking about conservation uh, uh, of the Maasai land. And you're here again this time around. We are talking of climatic changes in Africa. You're equally a human rights lawyer and uh, an activist for democracy. A pleasure to have you once again. Uh, thank you, Rita, and good evening, everyone, or afternoon, I think, for others. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here uh, to discuss this pertinent issue that affects us as human beings everywhere. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. So let's just stay with you. It's a two hours interactive uh, program. You can equally leave your contributions on our Facebook page because the program is streaming already live on Facebook, Africa Media Live. Now, Mr. Ole Shange, it's, it's very important that while looking at climate change, which is a, a phenomenon that's affecting the globe uh, and uh, uh, having to talk about mitigation and adaptation, it is important for us to get to know, first of all, what mitigation and uh, adaptation it's all about uh, thank you thank you Rita to put it briefly uh, it, it is important to, to, to understand mm -hmm. the global warming the climate change is real it's not like some sort of artificial things being uh, maybe created by theory somewhere mm -hmm. there are real issues that affect us and when we say about the adaptations, uh, we mean taking measures to ensure that we coexist somehow. We the, the environment we are working on, but to ensure that we do some sort of things that ensure that we mitigate the impact of, of the climate change. And it is important because the one polluting environments and causing the global impacts to humanities it is us the human beings so we need to take some measures to ensure that we are as uh, my, my friend says to at least to lower the impacts it might not necessarily be as everywhere causing equally or on the same weight the impact of climate change but it also means we are contributing anyway in, in some degree. We are just uh, varying what uh, the global north is doing and what the southern world is doing. Uh, might be different, but we are all complicit to it. This is my, my opinion. So we have equal responsibility to ensure that we undertake some measures to at least mitigates the impact and of course there are many like reforestations we are cutting of trees at the ends we are suffering from lack of rainfall in some areas and in some areas uh, like there is freezing in europe on the northern part of the world and, and th things led to that so when we say about the mitigations we is what are we doing to mitigate the impact of the climate change and now for, for the adaptations is now working on some areas to uh, ensure that we adapt some ways again to ensure that we do not pollute uh, the world so much as we are using to to do that which otherwise uh, we know the, the, the technology which we like so much 
is complicit or contribute so much to what we are now befelling as human beings. So we need to uh, adopt some sort of uh, measures, technology and, and other things that are less impactful to the nature and, and, and which do not uh, affect the world. For example, we are using fuel all over uh, the world. Someone from Nigeria here, the oil spills and, and, and other things. How are we using technology that uh, mitigate the use of that resources to ensure that we do not uh, affect the, the, the global humanity? I, I, I can say that briefly, yes. Changi for your first take on this uh, panel of discussion. Let's get to you, uh, Mr. Dami Mola. Uh, Mr. Ole Shange has uh, put out in his own opinion what he thinks uh, the phenomenon or the strategies of mitigation and adaptation uh, are towards uh, uh, combating or, 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 or adapting to climatic changes which, is, uh, which are affecting the globe. In your own opinion, how best can you describe this? So when we talk about um, um, how we deal with climate change, um, we need to understand that these are the kind of problems that don't have a silver bullet, which means that there is not just one particular solution. They are going to, even when we say, okay, we are adopting one particular um, principle, there are multiple solutions, there are multiple paths that can be taken towards solving it. So when we talk about um, adaptation, adaptation to climate change comes in uh, multiple forms. So for instance, when we talk about uh, uh, coastal flooding that we've seen in um, part in uh, many parts of Nigeria, for instance, we need to talk about, okay, how do we relocate people away from flood-prone areas? How do we um, monitor? And uh, how do we moni monitor potential flooding? How do we predict? How do we uh, draw up building codes and um, land use um, laws that can help that can help to address the various is issues at hand? So, when we talk about adaptation, okay, um, agriculture. How do we um, move to climate change resistant um, farming um, farming uh, practices? Do we use uh, genetically modified crops for building um, for farming uh, um, crops? Crops? Do we? Use, uh, do we uh, move away from water resistant and food, water dependent food and staples to things that would do better in drier um, uh, areas? When we talk about migration, of course, we also have to talk about how do we manage migration? How do we ensure that um, when people, when people actually move from one area to another. They don't cause social economic disruptions. They don't cause social economic disruptions that can lead to um, conflict between those who were originally there and those who are, mig who are migrating. How do we handle the, the, the tensions between the, the um, aborigines and the, and the migrants? These are just some of the issues that need to be that need to be attended to. We also need to talk about the issue of food security, not just on a local scale, but maybe on a regional or a continental scale. So, um, as um, weather patterns um, change, can we ensure that those places that are more favorable for feeding for that are more favorable? can actually be supported on a continental or even on a regional scale so that they can produce enough food, not just to feed the local communities, but to feed um, entire countries. These are just 
um, some of the issues that um, climate change has um, um, brought forward that need to be addressed. Thank you. Mimola. Now, Mr. Elijah Noako, it's uh, said that if you can't fight it, then you join it. And uh, we, can, it's, it, we can refer to this kind of statement as the method of mitigation and adaptation which experts have proposed a solution to the climate change. Do you agree to this or do you think there is a better way, uh, uh, the, the globe and the, the African continent in particular, which is one of the most vulnerable <coughs> continents, can go about to fight against that climate change? Let me say this. Let me use this crude expression. Permit me the expression. Whether you're in Nigeria, you're in Cameroon, wherever it is, the issue of climate change is tico drink kumba drunk. That's what we are dealing here. Whether you're in Nigeria, you can call it a uh, Lagos drink onisha drunk, or you're in Botswana, you can juxtaposition the, the towns. This is what we are talking about here. You already said it in your prelude that Africa contributes to less than 6% of the world po pollution. What do we produce in Africa that's causing global warming? The greatest contribution of Africa is the global warming is what my colleague uh, uh, Damilola already said. It's just urbanization. People moving from local or rural areas and coming to town and causing a choke of the towns that have existed and therefore there's going to be um, um, transportation issues there are going to be issues with the um, sanitary system in the towns. There's going to be issue with water. There's going to be issue with food. There's going to be issue with things. But the question is, why are they moving away from the local communities where they live into the big towns? It's because, you know, the big industries that are coming there and felling their trees and doing all kinds of atrocities in their area are forcing them to flee from their rural areas and go and look for greener pastures in town. Take the case of Nigeria, where we had shell industry that polluted the Oguni area and killed thousands of natural resources and made it completely impractical for local people to plant crops. If you go to that area, you plant anything, it's not going to grow. So what do they do? They're going to leave the rural areas and go to the big towns in order to look for greener pastures. And by so doing, they're going to cause rural urbanization and migration, like my colleague Joseph already said, and this is going to result to global warming in its own way. So let's put this, I mean, put a square peg in a square hole. Yes, Africa needs to do its part. There's no doubt about that. You talk about all these adaptations. They're just talking about decisions that we need to take in our own little way to see that we reduce the impact of global warming. But I still say it here, it's a case of Tico drink kumba drunk because Africa can it's doing what they're supposed to do. But the polluters, the big polluters, the United States, China, you know, the rest of the world, they are polluting the world with their industrialization, with their agricultural practices, with their different combustion systems, and Africa is paying a heavy price. We just saw in Nigeria about 1,500 people died because of flooding. You know, many people are going to blame that on a dam that overflowed in Cameroon or whatever it is. But these are all oceans and seas that are rising because of global warming caused by the industrialized nations. So Africa, yes, is supposed to do its part. There is no doubt about that. We need to curb this rural exodus into you know, into towns. We need to curb this deforestation. We need to curb, like my friend talked about in the Maasai, I think, I don't know if it's from that area. We need to curb, you know, the, the harvesting of the Maasai land for industrialization purposes and causing them to lose their natural habitat. We need to curb all that. But again, who are the big polluters? It is not Africa. Africa is supposedly doing what they're supposed to do. When you talk about you know, in the Western world here, they are talking about building, you know, houses that are energy efficient, building this. You don't talk about energy efficient in Africa where we are having temperatures about 35 degrees, 40 degrees. We don't talk about those things. Africa is not the one contributing in that area. You talk about cars that are polluting because the carbon content of that, it's huge. How many people have cars in Africa? How many? We do a lot of tracking. We see here in the Western world, people are trying to adapt to, you know, using their bicycles and uh, 
forms of energy that is going to pollute less, but the people in Africa are already doing that. We trek most of the time. We go to our mountains, we walk, we do all this. We're already doing that. We have, very few people are using transportation means that actually pollute. You talked about, you know, um, um, uh, photo, I mean, uh, the agricultural sector, for example, because it's been known that just the fertilization and the chemicals that are used in in industrialization in, term, in, uh, in the agricultural sector in the Western world is contributing hugely to global warming. How many people use fertilizers or any sort of that in Africa? Very few. We use our natural manure. It doesn't produce methane. It doesn't produce CO. It doesn't produce all this. Yes, we do have cows that cow fats and cow dung do produce. But again, how many people do industrialization, commercial farming of industri industri uh, uh, industrialization of um, cows? Not many. We do the use of natural means. So in a nutshell, yes. Africa is going to do its part in terms of adapting to climate change. Africa is going to do what they need to do to curb deforestation. But again, who is cutting down the trees? Mostly it's not Africans. It's Western industries that are coming to Africa to fell the trees for commercial purposes. So the government needs to look into that. Yes, Africa needs to curb the migration of people from their, from their local uh, um, habitats in the rural areas that you know, from going to um, urbanization, we know that Africa is the fastest growing continent in terms of people moving from their local rural areas into the cities. Yes, that's going to cause global warming. But again, what is the cause of that? It's because people are looking for greener pastures. If they have their local industries being harnessed in a way that the profits from that local industries benefits them, they're, going to, they're not going to leave their natural rural environment to go to the cities to cause all this. So in a nutshell, before I will come back, I want to say that the West, the West, I'm happy that this COP27 is coming to Africa. African activists, African political leaders, African free thinkers, African civil society, they should rally up and demand that the West should pay its fair share. We could call these reparations, global warming reparations to Africa. All the ills that are happening in Africa, uh, you already mentioned that in your intro about the amount of drought that's happening in Africa, the amount of food insecurity that we're facing in Africa, the amount of difficulty that Africans have been put through as a result of global warming, it's caused by the West. It's not caused by Africans. You mentioned already, 6% of global warming comes from Africa. The rest come from these polluters in the industrial world. So those who are going to Cairo, please pray for Africa to have its fair share. Those polluters should pay into Africa. There's something we call carbon pricing. Africans can greatly benefit from that. Those who pollute more should pay those who pollute less. That is what carbon pricing is all about. Africa should benefit from this initiative, and that is what my perspective on this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah. I would like to join Mr. Lishangi. Now, we're talking about mitigation measures, which are set to, to, to be actions taken to curb and uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, while uh, uh, adaptation measures are set to be based on reducing the vulnerability uh, to the effects of climate change. So we can say, uh, in other terms, that mitigation attends to the causes, while adaptation attends to the, the impacts of climate change. Now, what about these vulnerable countries? Are uh, these vulnerable countries like Mozambique, Kenya, Malawi, South Sudan, which we earlier mentioned, able to sit up to the measures and survive from uh, 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 repercussions of these climatic changes? Like we can see in the videos, uh, images that are, 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 are being uh, 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 shown on the pay on the screen we can see from there how countries suffer from from uh, erosion from flood and from drought can these vulnerable countries really sit up with uh, to these measures to survive from the repercussions of climate change mr ole shangi thank you uh i think africa still has some capacity of course not all, all of it but at least we have capacity to take our own initiatives. Uh, because at least, and I think as Enoko has said, um, we are not the greatest pollutants, though we are. We are contributing, but the facts. 
and our countries tanzania you can see kenya are suffering uh one of the greatest droughts uh, so far as i know uh, but if we are to reform our own ways not forcing because uh enoka said one of the things is urbanizations and i think out of ignorance we are forcing you have just mentioned the case of the Maasai. You are forcing people to urbanize while there is a causative uh, agents for, for global warming and climate change. There are people with their own indigenous knowledge who knows how to protect their environments. And because of economic greed of the few, then you force some measures that ultimately affect not only the people you are intending to, but ultimately the entire nation and, and the globe. Now, responding to your question as to whether this country can, can adopt, African financially might not be super to address the issues uh, of climate change, but at least the environment in some areas still allow. And one of the things we can do, I think, in my opinion, if we are to, I can give one example of Tanzania. Uh, the last four years, uh, they went to uh, uh, sell a game reserve and fell down almost 3 million trees for a certain project, which is yet to be finalized. And would, there is no even sign for it. But at the end, we are feeling the consequences. So if we are to adapt measures to ensure that at least we don't fell unnecessary trees, we do not sell, uh, because one of the things someone has said, some people maybe from Europe and other comes and take timber to some places, the Congo, Tanzania and others. If we are to address our own natural ways is a way we can mitigate. The difficult part of it is the economic. How are we economically to adopt the, 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 the uh, and or, and of course mitigate the, the the impact brought by by the climate change the, the mozambiques with their own issues in the copa delgados and others uh financially economically they might not be able to do on their own ways but i think as enuko said uh because the greatest uh polluters are people from the North world and, uh, and others those countries should at least benefit in some instances from the, the, the pollutants and we're saying of the industrialized world uh, who are putting a lot of uh, impact to, to, to the nature. But I think, and I can repeat this, there are ways our own communities can find their own natural ways to mitigate the impact to resist, for example, the influence of felling down trees, protecting water sources, and of course, leaving out the greedy of uh, victim communities to give way for activities that ultimately uh, impact the environment. And, and of course, you know, poverty is one of the, 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 the causative agents of environmental pollution in my opinion because poor people are good in in over utilizing the resources for survival so we address the poverty there is many ways we are adding value to the fight against the impacts of of climate change you force africa to be poor through over exploitations of resources and manpower and and everything you ultimately means they cannot uh, mitigate the impact of uh, climate change. They cannot adopt measures that ultimately slow the, the, the pace of the impact of, of uh, climate change. So, yes, as Africa, we are in a position that we can do something. And this is so that we are not the greatest pollutants, but again, our environments are a bit somehow natural than in other places.
but the negative part of it we are not strong economically and of course there are leadership issues uh that everyone is looking on how to sell uh for for their own ends or, or benefits that's the the obstacles that we have as africa to to to, to address these issues Now, Mr. Dami Mola, just to continue in the same light, we have uh, the least developed countries in Africa, which are among the most vulnerable to climate change, yet they are the least capable or able to adapt to, uh, uh, to, 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 adapt to these effects of climate change. So you as a public affairs uh, analyst, how do you think uh, 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 these countries, these vulnerable countries, uh, what do you think they need to do? And in the posi Nigeria, in its own position, how does Nigeria contribute to, to, to assist countries, uh, uh, vulnerable countries that are hit by impacts of climate change? So, so in the terms of uh, public affairs, one thing that I believe is very, very important Important. Apart from just um, the economic firepower that is needed to implement changes, is actually a problem of leadership. Um, as um, one of my co-analysts has pointed out, decades or even let's just say centuries of um, economic exploitation of African communities, African societies, and African countries has left um, these entities far too weak to be able to help themselves. And um, what do I mean? We can go back to the transatlantic slave trade. We can go back to the colonial era. We can even go back to the new, new colonialism that, um, that we saw after the um, independence struggles, where um, great world powers used both overt and covert means to influence the leadership of their various of their various countries to achieve their own selfish economic economic uh, aims. So unfortunately, um, a lot of the corruption that the that a lot of these con these um, companies, particularly their commercial entities, what the, the a lot of the corruption that they encouraged amongst African leaders have meant that. Far too many countries don't have stable social political social uh, political structures that can help people identify their problems, draw up plans to draw up plans to, ad to address them, and carry out effective inter intervention measures, either through mitigation or adapt adaptation. Um, ever so often, particularly amongst the oil majors. We often hear reports in the in 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 even in the advanced countries where they are, where their governments actually accuse them and find or or sentence their executives for for bribing uh, for bribing uh, local uh, local officials. So we can talk of the shell case that has been going on in uh, in the Netherlands. We can talk of the two thousand and elf AG uh, cases that have been going on in Italy. We can talk of uh, various uh, cases that have gone on in the in the US and in the UK. What has happened is that this what corruption does is that it tends to push out those it tends to push out those who are actually seeking the best possible outcomes for their people and it brings all it's 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 elevates or promotes only those who are there for their own selfish uh, uh, needs so really if uh, we're talking about uh, uh, great powers the industrialized west trying to assist uh, trying to assist uh, african countries particularly poor, poor african countries one thing that they must do is that they must change the way they do business, which means that they must crack down harder on on their nationals, 
and their and their uh, corporations for their corrupt practices, they must put an end to doing business with corrupt individuals, corrupt political office holders. I mean, London, um, London is regularly London Financial Center is regularly referred to as Bos as uh, Moscow Grad, which is essentially where corrupt oligarchs from Russia and other European countries move their money to London, to Zurich, to New York, in order to essentially in order to launder it and to invest in um, in Britain's um, real estate real estate um, industry. So yes, these countries need financial resources, but more importantly, they need leadership resources, which means that. They need to have a crop of leaders who properly understand the problem and who are ready to do the hard work, to take the hard de the decisions of socially and economically sustainable interventions for both mitigation and adaptation that will help their citizens, that will let their citizens achieve better outcomes, outcomes for, the, for themselves. Okay. I hope uh, Mr. Damimola is not leaving us. I uh, hope his connection is going to sit back to have him continue with this program. Let me now get to you, Mr. Elijah. He talked about governments, the role played by governments in, in, um, in contributing to some of these impacts or the effects that uh, their citizens go through in some of these vulnerable countries. It brings us now to, to ask this question. It is argued that Africa's ability to benefit from uh, sustainable development synergies uh, 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 embedded in the mitigation and adaptation strategies is greatly limited by institutional and policy environment that hinders funding capacity and techn technological innovation systems development. Now that's in line uh, with uh, 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 what Mr. Dami Mola was saying about the role played by some of the government, uh, uh, governments of the various countries. The, the role not being, they not playing the right role because maybe at the start point they, it's not even the right government that is in place. So do you think the institutional and um, policy uh, uh, institutional government and uh, policy government is, is, is contributing in some of these impacts? 100%, Rita, 100%. We know that. I don't want to go into a lot of technical stuff, but let me tell you this. If you look at some of the things that are destroying the environment or contributed by Africans, look at the coastal wetlands in Africa. Because that's an ecosystem that has marshes, mangroves, you know, it acts like some sort of filtration for water systems and floods. If you look at that and look at the strategy of various African governments when it comes to protecting the coastal wetland, it's either non existent or it runs amok. And anybody does anything, anybody locks around there, anybody does fishing around there. Anybody does anything. There is no coordinated effort by the government that be to protect strategic assets that is going to guarantee or at least mitigate the impact of climate change. You mentioned about the Sahel. The Sahel depends 70% on rain, natural rain, to, you know, I mean, and coastal areas for the agriculture. But what happens? You have this foreign governments, not, not foreign government, foreign companies that come in to do logging within that same coastal areas and the wetlands. You have foreign entities, foreign organizations, foreign companies that come in. I mentioned the Ogoni land. That's an example of a coastal wetland that is supposed to be highly protected. As we speak, everybody knows that Nigerians just lost about 1,500 people. 1,500 people. And that is the area where you have all the lock, you have all the shells, you have all the uh, 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 whatever you call, total, and all these companies doing massive exploitation in those areas 
unabated. When the government, you know, when activists like Ken Sarawewa came up in Nigeria to protest the devastating effect of the impact of Shell in the Ogoni land, what happened? We saw what happened. Ken Sarawewa was, was killed. In this part of the country where I live, I live with a lot of activists that ran away from Nigeria because of this same very thing, trying to protect the environment. What did the government of Nigeria do? We know what they did. They joined together with this corrupt company called Shell in order to, you know, kill the land, jail the people, and jail the activists. So yes, policies in Africa, in Africa are not helping because we need to protect what is ours. And that is how we contribute to, you know, mitigating some of the impact of global warming. Now, what about sustainable ag agroforestry? As I said before, nearly 25% of greenhouse gases in Africa is coming from, you know, cutting of trees, afforestation. I mean, out of the 6% that we talked about that Africa contributes, 25% of it is coming from just the cutting of trees, cutting down of all this that we are talking about, and then, uh, uh, deforestation. So the government, the governments in Africa, they need to have a clear, a clear land management schemes that says it doesn't matter which companies were given the right to exploit in this area. You are not exploiting the Maasai land. You are not exploiting the coastal region of the southwest in Cameroon. You are not exploiting the coastal land of the Ogoni people in Nigeria. And so on and so forth. They go to the Sahel that is suffering from, you know, drought and all this. They are supposed to be protected areas within those communities that government is not supposed to be churning out, you know, it's become a milking cow, churning out, you know, patches of land to all the companies that come to log or do whatever it is. So these policies need to be put in place. Not only that. We, I talked about, you know, this industrialization, people leaving their normal rural areas where they live, their way of living, and flogging to towns. The United Nations came with a report that says Sub-Saharan Africa, as you speak, is the fastest growing urbanization sector in Africa, in the world. By 1960, only about 20% of Africans, I mean, Sub-Saharan Africans live in cities. But as you speak, it's close to 50. Everybody's living this the rural areas because of either afforestation, drought, or whatever it is, because the government are not putting in place strategies for these people to stay in their land, or either they're taking away their land from them. That's why sometimes you hear about this United Nations indigenous people's land right, but it's just on paper. It's just on paper. We don't find concrete action of the indigenous people having the right to control their own land, but the government keeps going in cut it, gut it down, give it to multinationals to exploit. And then Africa feels the impact. We see the flooding. We see the drought. We see the hunger. We see the strife. And, you know, this is the elephant in the room in Africa is what my colleague said, uh, Joseph, if I remember it was Joseph or Damilola. Poverty. Poverty. The United Nations Climate Action committee must address the causes of poverty in Africa. That is how they are going to address global warming mitigation effect in Africa. All these, you know, efficient housing, efficient this, that is the Western world ways of mitigating climate change. They should look for local solutions to local problems. That is not a mitigation strategy of Africa. That's not how Africa pollutes. Africa pollutes because there's poverty. People are leaving their rural areas and going to cities. And therefore, it's going to cause choking the cities and warming in some sort. It's going to cause urbanization issues. If you have a town that was built for 20 houses, and the drainage system in that town is designed for 20 houses, and then suddenly you have 1,000 people living in a town that was designed for 20 people. What do you think is going to happen to the drainage system? What do you think is going to happen to the water system? What do you think is going to happen to you know all the other things that people are going to rely on to their daily living? It's going to pollute. Because people have left their own town, I mean, their rural areas, they've come to industrial cities, but those industrial cities were not built for that capacity and for those number of people. So the United Nations must address poverty in Africa. If they're really, really serious about global warming on how Africans can contribute to mitigating it, 
That is how you mitigate climate issues in Africa. Not about some fancy, you know, uh, energy efficient building or cars with less, you know, emitting engines. Or those things are good for the Western world. That's not how Africa mitigates. We know how Africa can mitigate global warming. And as I said for my prelude, Africa is suffering a colossal amount of effect of what they do not cause. So the the COP27 in Egypt must look into this. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah. Now, Mr. Olishangi, Mr. Elijah mentioned poverty as one of the main reasons of global warming and uh, to that effect, climate change in Africa. Do you agree? Can, can we uh, relate uh, uh, the situation of the Maasai people's seized land in Tanzania as also one of these reasons? Because remember, their land was being seized uh, to, for, to be given to a foreign country to carry out some other uh, gaming uh, project on it. So can we relate this also to that particular instance? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and actually, I said it earlier. Uh, that poverty is one of the positive agents for what many of the African countries are suffering. Because poor people anywhere are very good stakeholders in utilizing resources for them to survive. So they will cut trees for firewood, yes. They will, they will do everything to survive, so they will depend on the nature. And now coming to your questions as to what's happening, for example, with the Maasai. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, poverty again uh, has another uh, issue. Poor people are good in multiplying. It's very simple. So, which otherwise, high population rise also must have negative impact on nature. And poor people worldwide are good in again multiplying. So it is true, you want to address this climatic change issues uh, in African perspective, which I agree entirely. One of the things or the thematic area you need to address is poverty. Uh, when you address, then it means you empower people to take some measures. And of course, they will be having some economic activities that allow them to to, to to protect the environment. And now coming to the question of the Maasai, uh, you, you have asked. It is true, of course, uh, because the government says they want to take them to some unknown lands, some 700 kilometers away, and saying they want to protect the environment. But do they actually the business they want to create it is the one causing a uh, negative impact to the nature uh, science has said this we have been saying this throughout you 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 force out the maasai to replace them with five star hotels the water being used by the maasai the entire village will be used by one hotel is that water is enough for almost three or four village then you remove all of them you replace with the hotels are you doing better to protect water service or water or the drainage system no again you you force them so that you ensure in in that place there are at least two thousand vehicles in a day are you doing justice to the nature no you are doing injustice to it so it is true the measures being employed by the governments are in fact adversely affecting not only the mass which they are targeting but also the nature they purport to protect and of course because when we say the global we are saying for humanity and for other other species you remove the mass so that you get exclusive places to hunt for wule massacre is that adding value it is not so Africa is taking wrong measures. And I can give one example of Tanzania. You take wrong measures purporting to address uh, the, the, the global challenges 
the now the world is moving for example the 3030 um protecting uh 30 percent of of the world of course the idea from europe being forced to africans but who are the victims because uh elijah said the, the migration the exodus of our communities being forced now to concert it in one one areas means the land created for one family now you'll be having 50 families forced into a certain area we have for example as the Maasai, because i'm, I'm a massive from uh, the place I, I, you're referring to we have our own climate change mitigation measures the resource use how do we use the the resources we means for the pastoralisms in a way that allows for recovery then avoid over utilizations and that at least the the area doesn't remain natural but at least remain of course because the people has been all over all the years and we cannot say uh remove the people to make it natural no but at least there are mechanism we can adapt to utilize the resources now you force them to replace with some unknown theories created in some office somewhere and you want to apply never tested anywhere so poverty and of course for the case of the masses they are forcing them to be poor then now accusing them of threatening environment because you force them that you cannot accuse them of causing adverse impact. They will utilize the resources. They don't have a, 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 other means. So it is true. They are very much related to poverty. One is a causative agent direct to, to global uh, or climatic change. But again, poor people will multiply and, and of course will be running everywhere for survival. And then the exhaust us to town areas, then at, you get urbanizations, then you have what you have in Europe and America. That's uh, which otherwise, the next few years, Africa will be contributing the same way the global north is 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 causing. But we we have still chances of addressing our issues. You are this poverty, then you are sure at least you may get some impact. Our people can remain on their own natural environments, but in a sustainable way, in a having life with dignity, in the same circumstances they were living. But now, some people from Europe, from uh, America, coming with some theories and says the best way to protect this land, take these people, concentrate them in some camps uh, in the in the coastal part of the country. That's not the things they should have been doing. They should have been of course engaging the people who have the problem of leadership of we have said it earlier. So yes, it is true. Thank you very much, Mr. Olishangi. Is uh, Mr. Dami Dami Mola back? Okay, Mr. Yes, Dami Mola. Tomorrow, uh 6th of uh, November, countries will again uh, gather to the 18th in Egypt to take actions towards achieving uh, uh, the world's collective uh, climate goals as agreed under the Paris Agreement. So, however, some African participants think this is just going to be another opportunity for paper promises to be tabled and not being uh, uh, for, for, for many promises to be tabled and just left or as, as paperwork. Are they right to have this impression? So one thing that needs to be understood is that climate change is, as my fellow participants have um, emphasized, climate change is a global problem. It's not an African problem. It's not a European problem. It's not an American problem. It's a global problem. And a global problem means that we must have global solutions. And for us to have global solutions, we must engage with all, with everyone who is involved. Mm -hmm. So we must engage with local people. We must engage with national leaders. We must engage with regional bodies. We must engage with activists. Mm -hmm. 
and it is and um, the global and it's just and it's another opportunity for us to engage with like with uh, like-minded supporters all over the world as uh, mr elijah pointed out we have activists in europe we have activists in canada we have people who have been forced to migrate partially because of these issues and uh, our government's failed responses to them who reside in these places and who understand who are who are still ready and willing to engage on these issues so when we say oh because um, uh, various uh, other foras have failed to achieve a uh, concrete uh, solution so we must simply disengage and face our problems ourselves one thing we know is that on our on our own we do not have the we do not have the financial or institutional um, firepower to address these issues by ourselves we need partners we need supporters we need um, the coming together of like minds to exchange ideas exchange uh, exchange ideas bring up new uh, new thinking of course we know that as uh, the Maasai people um, are facing issues in, in 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 Kenya and Tanzania we so also uh, in indigenous people facing the same kind of climate induced uh, challenges in places like Brazil in places like Chile and uh, the Amazon rainforest of South America they are facing the aborigines of Australia are also facing the same kind of challenges so I disagree that we cannot separate ourselves in trying to answer this uh, in trying to face these challenges yes Africans must think for themselves and must implement solutions that address African problems they cannot come and do that for us but that doesn't mean that we should raise up the ramparts and barricade ourselves and and uh, block ourselves from sharing experience from sharing knowledge and experiences with those who are also trying to solve the same problem in other parts of the world i believe that it is uh, even if uh, the global north has uh, continued to shrink from its responsibilities from problems that they have largely caused we must still go out talk to them make people aware of the challenges that we that we face and more importantly talk to others from across the world who are facing these same kind of challenges how can we learn from their experiences how can we learn from how they've implemented various kind of solutions what has worked what has not worked what needs further fine tuning that is the only way that we can actually uh, 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 build up efficient inter efficient interventions. Mr. Dami Mola, let me now come to you, uh, Mr. Elijah. We have the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who has repeatedly uh, pointed out that the gap in the commitment of developed countries to deliver on their 100 million 100 us billion uh, climate com uh, commitments annually it's really wide implying that most of these developed countries who take commitments and engagements uh, towards uh, combating climate change do not uh, do them at the end of the day, giving reasons to some of these participants at uh, the, uh, the 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 con uh, the climate change conferences to to have the impression that every new climate change conference is just a repetition of new promises that are not going to 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 be to be honoured. And there it is again, uh, COP twenty seven coming on. So what how how do you do you agree or do you uh, abide with the opinion or the impression of uh, these african participants who say that uh, these uh, climate change conferences are turning out not to have any uh, uh, resolute uh, solutions to the problem 
that is why I have advocated for all non-governmental organizations in Africa, environmental activists, civil society, scientists of African origin to flock to Cairo, demonstrate there about this because Africa is not getting its fair share from this deal. The polluters that will make all these glamorous promises at the end of the day, nothing comes out of it. I'll give you an example. Scientists came out and presented it to United Nations uh, Climate Action Group that if Africa was to implement a diversification program in its crop production, Africa is going to contribute immensely in global um, global uh, warming in, in, in its different ways. What do I mean by that? They came out with, I think, uh, if I remember, uh, a budget of $41.6 billion that if the big polluters in the world were to contribute this amount of money and give it to African countries to implement a diversification program. What does that mean? Diversification simply means if African countries that are living in climate prone environment realize that they are running into issues, you can, if you are planting crops that are reliant on a particular, you know, amount of water, you can diversify to uh, climate resistant crops. You can diversify to livestock. You can diversify to different ways that can mitigate the impact of climate change. And they came out with a budget of 46 points, 41.6 billion, if I remember correctly. And they said, this money should be handed to Africans. And they're going to reduce the impact of that. Not only that, they came out with this carbon pricing strategy. Carbon pricing strategy is a strategy where those who pollute more, they are being taxed per ton of carbon that they pollute. And that money should be given to less polluting countries to mitigate the impact of climate change. We are not seeing that happening. So right now, as we speak, it's been predicted by scientists that by 2050, 2050, it's not far from here, the glaciers that we have in Kilimanjaro National Park and Mount Kenya are going to be all melted. Not melted by Africans. It's melted by global warming that's happening somewhere in China, somewhere in the United States, somewhere in Canada, somewhere in Europe. But Africa is going to suffer the effect. Why can these countries, you know, ob I mean, uh, ob I mean um, come together accept or fulfill their engagement in this global warming pact that they have engaged in. And we see, if you look at the strategies, every country has its target that's supposed to cut by this number of year, uh, this number of tons of uh, carbon, CO, CO2, cut this, cut this, cut this. But by the end of the following year, when the next COP is gonna be meeting, more than 60% of them have not met, would not have met their climate uh, global warming target. But they are expecting Africans to contribute their own fair share. Meanwhile, they are not meeting their own target and their own obligation, obligation under the global warming. So this is where I say there's a lot of hypocrisy in the whole deal. There's a lot of, you know, lack of bad faith from the big government in the Western world, who are supposed to come to the table to see that since, you know, we all know that this is a global issue, each quarter is contributing its own, its own quarter to seeing that global warming is mitigated. And now we're talking about Africa. Africa has the tools, has the knife and the yam to mitigate this thing. If their own partners, since this is a global issue, it's not an African issue alone. If the partners that be help Africans to mitigate this, Africans can go a long way in reducing the impact of global warming. As I said before, we've already mentioned some of the things that are how Africa causes this. We've mentioned about deforestation. We've mentioned about urbanization. We've mentioned about rural migration to the cities. We've mentioned so many things. But Africa can mitigate that if the powers that be meet their obligations. These obligations will help Africans Make sure that the carbon pricing is fair. Africa is getting a fair share of the carbon tax. Make sure that, you know, this diversification that Africa has accepted, that they welcome it, 
make sure that the money is going to Africa to see that they can diversify the economy and move away from practices that are going to either, I mean, um, uh, increase the impact of global warming or either make it worse. We've talked about mitigation if impact here. There's very little tools in the toolkit of Africans to mitigate these issues because they, like unlike the industrialized nations, they are not really capital. I mean, uh, 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 um, capital intensive in terms of industries and polluting industries and the means at their disposal are not there. But in terms of what they can do, if they help, if the global economy helps Africans, of course, Africans can stop the you know or migration of uh, people from rural areas. They can do that. They can diversify their economy. They can div diversify crop production. They can diversify livestock production. They can do so many things that is within their disposal, and it doesn't need a lot of money. It doesn't need a lot of income. It doesn't need a lot of capital revenue to get these things done in Africa. But the hypocrisy that's coming from the Western world is the one that is killing this global initiative to combat global warming. If they pay their fair share and come to the table and do what they have agreed to do, global warming will be reduced and the whole world will be in a better place. Uh, and for others joining in at this point in time, it's the Pan-African debate. As you can see on your screen, climate change impacts. Can Africa survive through mitigation and adaptation is what we have been analyzing for the past uh, one and a half hour. So we continue. We have uh, on our panel uh, uh, democracy, activists for democracy and human rights lawyer, Mr. Uh, uh, Mo Joseph Oleshange. So uh, I, I come back to join you now to bring this other worry. So we, we, we are talking about these impacts of climate change all through and how vulnerable Africa is most hit, whereas it is not, uh, 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 it is the least contributor to, 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 to uh, gl gas emissions. Why now do climate change research works mostly focus more on countries outside Africa, whereas uh, Africa has relatively the lowest coping capacity? Uh, th thank you, if I understood it is, uh, so much of the work to protect or to actually to mitigate uh, the, 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 the global warming mm -hmm. uh, and the climate change is, is being done in Africa uh, because actually the other places in the world are worst case, but the, the, the only things, for example, you, you need to do in Europe and others because the industrialized nations and Africa is still, uh, I think, like I just said, uh, only six percent or so is the one we are contributing. There are at least more than enough space, at least, uh, for Africa to adapt and mitigate. And particularly, given that not only is not industrialized, but also the environment still allows now in my opinion this should be a double work you do not only take those measures to africa because it's still somehow uh, natural than than the rest of the world but you need as elijah said to undertake parallel process you cannot tell the african to protect there are 30 percent of the environments otherwise evicting their people through the theories formed by in unknown areas then the the same industrialization nation and, and and the global north are still doing what they has been doing all over for 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 the last one or so centuries the the the, the the, the the ice melting and uh, and issues we are saying about the Kilimanjaro and and and, and Kenya uh, uh, and Mount Kenya is not resulted from what is being done in Kenya or in Tanzania or in Uganda. It is some 
big business in China, in America, and other, and other. But the people feeling the the, the the impact of the of the global warming, the, the most impacted people throughout the world is Africa, which is the least uh, contributor to the emissions and 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 what is really causing uh, climate change. So I think there are some. Uh, either misconception or at least a wrong target if you are to target only Africa to take measures. Africa need to take because one is more impacted than any other place. But again, they, are, they can easily meet, uh, re-adapt than any other, any other part of the world. But of course, you need to put a lot of pressure from the people contributing the substantial part of what is impacting the world. The, the the global north the, the industrialized nations the and of course even what's happening in africa because they are doing some business in their own countries that impacts so so much of the world but again they're the one conducting part of the biggest lodging in africa and and many of the big uh, industries in africa again is benefiting the same people who are doing so much again in their own continents to impact the world through the global uh, uh, global warming and, and climate change. So uh, to put it, it is wrong to only target Africa and assuming that you'll be addressing the impact of climate change if the Africa will take serious measures to it. Still, you need to put more pressure particularly in the people and communities and nations that produce the greatest emission that impacts uh, the world. So, and who actually have so much of the economic muscles to address this issue than in the country like Mozambique with their own troubles. Uh, so you need to take undertake a parallel process and particularly to the real causative agents, the, 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 the rich nations the industrial nations who are causing so much uh, of what is of what is happening, so is wrong to target the African, particularly thinking they can readapt and make the world a better place because they are the least. But of course, Africa need to take measures because they the 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 most impacted. They are poor. They do not have resources, and they are being over exploited than anyone. Thank you, Mr. Lishangi. Let me join back uh, uh, Mr. Damimola. Mr. Damimola, analysts have pointed out to a paradox which deserves some kind of reflection from us on this uh, panel this afternoon. And they ask how come it's possible that up to 45% of Africa's population has no access to electricity while the continent has the world's largest potential of renewable forms of, of energy. How possible is that? So again, it comes back to the thread that um, myself and my co-panelists um, have been have uh, been talking about in the last hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of Africa's potential has not translated into into measurable improvement in the lives that. In the, in the lives and livelihoods of Africans. We can see that, like I said, a lot of the uh, wealth and income that has come at the expense of Africans, from both, uh, both from political, from our political leaders and from uh, corporate, and from corporate uh, exploitation by foreign bodies, has not has not created a better life for uh, Africans. Yes, we can talk about things like wind power, solar power, hydroelectric power. But the problem, but the problem is that a lot of the finances, a lot of the resources that are coming out from all these, uh, that are coming from the exploitation of African resources, are not going into African lives. Those that do make it to African countries are being diverted 
away. So a lot of the issues of uh, institutionalized corruption that we see in African countries, uh, we, uh, fraud, waste and graft that we see in a lot of uh, the finances of African governments, what that has done is that our people have been or a, or a, a, the vast majority of Africans have been unable to tap into the potentials and the possibilities that are available in the more industrialized uh, parts of the world. Of course, uh, one of course a way to look at uh, a, an industry or a, of a of an economy is what what uh, uh, what are the, the various things that are impacting a measure like inflation. In, in the industrialized world, when they measure inflation, energy energy prices are usually the biggest contributors of inflation. But in uh, less developed um, African societies, the biggest drivers of inflation are usually food prices because people really don't have access to the kind of energy that they need to power their homes, to power their offices, to power industries. So when we talk about so so when we talk about oh Africans don't have access to um, efficient power to renewable power. The thing is that power is one of those things that cannot be done by an individual or by small communities. It is the kind of project that needs to bring together the full resources of a nation or even regions. Where people, because that's because the kind of skill efficiencies of skill that you will get from that you get from hydroelectric dams cannot be compared to what you will use if you are driving a diesel or a petrol powered uh, generator in a in a household. Of course, the costs go up per per individ, per individual. And of course, the impact on the climate through the release of uh, of greenhouse gases is also driven up by individual. So, of course, it's a combination of many things. Governments have not brought have not brought themselves together to access the opportunities that technology, particularly in the last 30, 40 years, um, and advanced research towards uh, renewable, renewables, the kind of uh, uh, innovations that, that, are, that are being developed in other parts of the world. Our governments have not been able to tap into those opportunities. And that's the reason why we are seeing those, we are seeing those kind of statistics. statistics. Thank you, Mr. Damimola. We are we are we are now uh, analyzing uh, the various solutions. There are some analysts who have said that uh, the African continent, though vulnerable, can also be a solution to the problems of uh, uh, climate change. Like some have uh, 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 proposed that, given the larger uh, uh, mass, large mass, and hundreds of millions of hectares of land that can be restored to health for food production and water conservation. Ecosystem restoration will indeed provide multiple solutions to various crises, including drought, poverty, land, and biodiversity loss. So, Mr. Uh, Enoaku, get listening to this, what do you think? <coughs> so, Rita, um, let me pick it from where you, uh, my colleague, um, being a dummy lula uh, ended so that's a critical path in terms of african has the resources even to help the rest of the world let me be very very specific here. africa has the resources to help even the rest of the world mitigate climate impact you mentioned about electricity you are in cameroon you know about lake uh menchu the menchu four science and engineering and technology and people from different walks of life who have worked in Cameroon 
have looked at the dam and come out with statistics and um, design that says if the government of Cameroon with their international partners were to implement a dam over like Menchum, that dam is going to supply electricity to the whole of West Africa. To the whole of West Africa. So the energy crisis in the whole of West Africa, we are talking about, when I say West Africa, that includes even, you know, part of Central Africa. We're talking about Nigeria with a colossal issue of electricity. We're talking about Cameroon. We're talking about Equatorial Guinea. We're talking about Gabon. We're talking about Congo. We're talking about Chad. We're talking about even the countries after Niger, I mean, uh, after Nigeria, like Liberia. That dam alone can supply electricity to that part of the world. Why can the government of Cameroon, in conjunction with its international partners, target these resources that we have that can greatly reduce the impact of global warming and energy mm -hmm. crisis? We have the IMF, the World Bank, and the Britain Wood institutions coming out with structural adjustment program. So this structural adjustment program, they look at governments that are poor, and they say, we want to help you mitigate this, that, that, that. And global warming is always part of what they talk about. They will come up with these uh, draconian measures and say, we want you to target this aspect of the economy, this aspect, this aspect. We're going to give you this amount of money. But why can't they target, in, you know, push those governments to target those resources that are available, cheap, solar, a lot of, you know, sun in Africa, that we can use all those, that sun and harness it and produce electricity. A lot of wind in Africa, why can't they harness in their structural adjustment programs and push this African government to institute this program and say, you have a lot of sun, you have a lot of wind. Why can't we institute high wind power stations local solar panel system stations and that is going to help the economy and it's going to help not just mitigating the energy crisis it's going to also help the poverty we talk about you know poverty being one of the causes of a global warming and it's causing africans to migrate from their local areas into uh, urban cities it's going to help them stay in the environment why can the world bank and the global uh, um, uh, global action uh, committee come out with these strategies and enforce it in the uh, global strategic plan that they are forcing down the throat of Africa, Africans. Because you have a lot of Africans that are still under the uh, strategic uh, uh, adjustment programs. Even Cameroon, even Ghana, all these countries, they are under the uh, structural adjustment program. And they are trying to implement what the World Bank and the IMF and these Britain Wood institutions have shut down their throat. But why can these institutions see these avenues and say, we are strategizing with these countries so that they can revamp the economy. But these are these are areas that we should push them towards because left to the African government alone, just like my friend in Nigeria already said, you're not going to find this happen. We have corruption at the highest level, bad governance here and there, dictators here and there, people putting money into their pockets. It's not going to happen. But these Britain Woods institutions with their power that they have, with the economic power, they say when somebody, you know, power lies in, in the purse, they have the purse. And they're pushing this African government, but they are forgetting the areas that can help mitigate global warming as we speak. They're, you know, forgetting those areas. Now, to come back to your question, if I remember, you know, the um, why can't African government take, you know, control of these and make it, mitigate this? Let's put this in perspective. To be clear, Africa only emit. Africa as a whole, all the countries in Africa emit close to 3.8%. But in contrast, China, one country, one country, they emit 23%. The United States, 19%. I think Europe is around 13%, something like that. So we are talking about a continent that emigrate, uh, emit this tiny fraction of global warming, suffering the effect of it all, bad governance, and we're talking about Heavy polluters who have the knife on the arm, they have the money, they have the power, they can influence these governments in Africa, refusing to do the right thing, but asking Africa to diversify, to do this, to do that, to do that. They know the solution. They know what Africa can do. Africa can help the world economy mitigate this. I talked about carbon pricing before. 
They know that if they tax the heavy polluters and this money goes to Africa, and Africa implement these some of these strategies that we are talking about here, it's going to help the whole world. You know, without going into technical issues and so on, we know what you know. Meet, you know how um, carbon dioxide is produced. We know how the mitigation effects are being carried out all over the world. We know all that. We don't need to go into technical issues. The Global Impact Committee, they know this. They are scientists. They are engineers. They are people that know all this. This is still the issue of Africa being relegated to the background. They are asked to do more with less. And the people that are polluting are not doing their fair share, but they're asking Africa to do more with less. And they have the nerve and the young Rita, as we're saying here, as we're talking before, Africa has, Africa can help the world. Africa is a global issue. A 0.1% rise in global warming is going to affect the whole world. A 0.1% reduction in global warming is also going to help the same world. The same whole world. So if they help Africans to mitigate some of this, it's going to help the whole world. So I am calling on the United Nations, the United Nations Forum, the Climate Action Group, the COP27 Committee, help Africa help the world. Help Africa to help the world. That should be the mantra from all activists that are going to Egypt. Help Africa to help the world. Africa have the knife and the yam in terms of the strategies and mitigation that they can put in place that is going to help the whole world make, mitigate this global war. Watch, Mr. Elijah Noaku, we are getting towards the end of this program, and you said a very interesting things there with your last statement. If the, the, the participants to COP27 or all those who know they have an important role to play in contributing to the support to whosoever or to the African countries in fighting this climate change should do so because by helping Africa, they are helping the world. So now, let me just stay with you before I go conclude with Mr. Uh, uh, with the others. Uh, at this point in time, it's, uh, it seems like we are no more at the point of mitigation, but rather at the point of adaptation. Now, with those concerned uh, who feel the, 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 who are hardest hit by the impact of climate change uh, on the part away from the government, on the part of the citizens and the dwellers of these various uh, areas, what do you think they can do at this point in time? There's, there are little, little things that we can do in Africa, Rita. Uh, so let's go into nitty gritties now. Since you're asking me a question that needs to go into nitty gritties. When you eat, you drink from your plastic bottle and you throw it into the drainage, what are you doing? When that drainage blocks, all the drainage in Douala, where you live blocks, what are you going to do? In Bopi, there's going to be flooding and people are going to die. That's climate issues. When you leave the town, you know, I mean, this, you know, your local communities, and you carry the whole family, and all of you are living in a two-bedroom house in Douala, in Yaoundé, in uh, Unicha, in Lagos, or in whatever city in Africa. What are you doing? What you're doing is you've abandoned a natural habitat that could have harnessed all those people with all those resources. You've gone to town, you're going to incre increase heat because population choke, when you have a population that is so tight and choked, you're going to increase not just the amount of pollution that comes from natural perspiration and all whatnot, you're going to increase the sewage system. If the sewage, like I said before, if the sewage system was designed for 20 people, and you now have 200 people, you're going to block all that drainage. You're going to cause global warming because the effect of it is that the drainage system is going to be overwhelmed and you're going to have issues with the drainage system. You're going to have issues with irrigation. You're going to have issues with many things. Number three, for us as Africans, you know, we have this kind of local farming where you go and call, you cut the grass, you till the ground, and you burn the grass at the end of the day. They feel that burning of the grass is going to become manure, and then it's going to help the crops grow. But the after effect of doing that, it's destroying the economy. I can go on and on and on. There are little things that we can do our own individual corner in Africa that will reduce global warming. But again, I will put the honest on the government and the global parties that are concerned, they can do more 
they can do more. The reason that person left is rural areas and came to town and all these things that I just mentioned is, are happening is because he cannot cope in his environment because there, something has either going on, there's deforestation, there is logging, there is poverty that is going, you know, poverty drives people from the rural areas. They go to the cities because they're looking for uh, greener pastures. If the powers that be and the government that be is going to help these people stay in their environment, stay in their local environment, and they have the tools to actually, you know, maintain and cultivate that environment in a very sustainable manner, it's going to go a long way. So poverty is number one as well. So to cap it off, since we're going to the end of the program, those little, little things that we can do at our own corner in Africa, please, let's do it. You don't, you know, you're not going to get up tomorrow and see, oh, I've contributed to global warming by 10%. But your little thing that you do, the little things that you take care of in your environment, you're not polluting, you're not throwing things around, you're not dumping where you're not supposed to dump, and so on and so forth and so forth. Those little things in our own area, you know, that we do in our own corner, go a long way to adapt, to, I mean, to mitigate. In terms of adaptation, that is more of a governmental policy for us to adapt to what we already have, the cause of global warming. It is more of a governmental policy. But for mitigating, we can do little, little things one by one in Africa to do our own part. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah Noaku, for your concluding statements on this program. Let me join uh, Mr. Joseph Oleshangi to give us uh, his last word on this, his watchword, his advice, and uh, what he thinks could be best for the people to be able to mitigate and adapt with the climatic changes. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and I think my, my, my last is statements stem from what Bami Mola and Analeja said and from actually the question you asked earlier. Uh, one of the key problems we are having as Africa is not only poverty, uh, we have repeatedly saying, it is on, not only like the external uh, pressure from the global north and others, but also sadly, we institutionalized two things the, the imperial systems of governance uh the presidency for others and the kings for others and dictatorship as part of it then again institutionalized corruptions so even if for some schemes that were intended to uh, work on mitigating the the impacts of climate change corruptions do not allow it to happen and sadly by the way we have failed now to if at all institutionalization is a good thing which i think then transparency and accountability is not part of that uh, efforts we have met so and to, to make my, my my last statement is for example i can give an example of my country uh, tanzania while there has been a lot of propaganda of nature protection and things like that. If you can ask the governments, how much are you putting, for example, on deforestation? It's entirely nothing. So the only measures now you are taking for environmental uh, uh, conservation, for example, is only on protection. That's giving some guys guns and hoping they will take care of the nation, uh, of the environment. It will not add value on anything. So we need to rethink and uh, adapt measures that really works, like uh, reforestation, put some part of the finances to ensure that you address uh, the, the, the impact to the nature. Because as human beings, we use resources from the nature, and particularly when you are so much poor then you need to at least uh, make some things to, to add value so then you can again uh, uh, take something at other times. And of course, as uh, Leja said, uh, Africa has greatest potential not only to address on African uh, perspectives, but of course add uh, so much to the world. 
if we can uh, make joint efforts. He has given, for example, the case of of, uh, of Cameroon on 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 electricity. We have high potentials of having a renewable energy, but the entire continent is almost dark. There is no electricity. There are some example of the project in the Congo, of course, in Tanzania. You you test this project, and after two years you leave it. If you come the case of Tanzania. The, the greatest potentials of doing corruption is on the energy sector. Then Africa will remain dark. So we need to re, restructure our working policies. Leave away those that does not work. Go to things that really have uh, help the people on the ground. And of course, being serious, reform our democracy. There is relationship between the system of governance, democracy, and what happens on the ground. And that's the most important thing. We need to reform the leadership we have so that they're accountable to the people, which otherwise there will be good conservation measures, mitigation measures, adaptation measures that will not only help our individual countries, the continent, but the entire world. But that will only work if the greatest pollutants also take responsibilities for what they are causing uh, to the world. That's what I can briefly say. Thank you very much, Mr. Joseph Moses Oleshangi. You are joining us from Tanzania. You are a human rights lawyer and activist for democracy. Let me get the last word from our third and the last panelist, Mr. Damimola Olawuyi joining from Nigeria, you're a public affairs uh, analyst. Give us your last and concluding statement on this uh, issue, how Africans can help themselves in this situation of crisis. Thank my two panelists for their insights and their thoughts on this very important um, issue. I also want to align myself with the points that they have made that it is about helping ourselves at the local level. More importantly, it's also about taking a look at it from a leadership level. What that means is that in all the decisions that we are making, we must have the environment at the back of our mind. When, we, when governments institute policies, we should interrogate what are the environmental effects of these policies, policies immediately in the long term. When we are having elections for leaders, like Nigeria is having elections the first quarter of uh, next year, unfortunately, the, the major political parties have different fora address the issue of climate change. We need to ask them, what are the specific plans to address, to address climate change? What are you, the steps that you promise that you will take Deal with the issue of to deal with the issue of flooding, issue of desertification, issues of sustainable and renewable energy, energy and, and, and power. How will you? How do you intend to address about uh, about sprawls? How do you intend to address environmentally sensitive housing and accommodation? How do you intend to address uh, issues of uh, farming? In an era of climate change, how do you intend to support headsmen as they as they deal with conflict with farmers and reduce uh, uh, grasslands and uh, what are the water sources? These are issues that we that we must ask our our leaders, and we must also hold them to account when they make when they make such promises. Of course, at the international level, all those who are involved in this in this fair, the scientists, the activists, they must continue to beat the drum and warn the world and warn the world that look, Africa's problems are the world's problems. The world's problems are Africa's problems, and they cannot continue to pay lip service lip lip service to it. A lot of the 
migration by Africans into Europe and, and, and the US is directly or indirectly climate driven. So these problems, if they are not handled soon, will show up at their doorsteps. So what that means is that as we hold our governments to account, they must also assist Africa to hold their own governments to account to the promises that they have made. And that is the only way that we can all address, address this problem. Thank you very much. Public Affairs Analyst, thank you very much for your contribution on this program. I should say it was your first time and it was an interesting uh, session of discussion to the viewers as we were looking at the impact of uh, the uh, climate change on Africa in particular and uh, uh, how this uh, continent can be able to sit up in order to mitigate or uh, adapt itself to these climatic changes or the crisis of global uh, warming and climate change. And we had a lot of proposals from our various panelists joining us from across the globe. And it is obviously uh, uh, at this point in time that we will have to pull in the curtains on today's edition of the Pan-African Debate. Appreciating your, your, your time for sitting with us and uh, joining in this program giving a big thank you equally to the technical department for the successful production with this i'll say goodbye have a wonderful weekend and see you next week for more editions